Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us here. Um, I am also in London. You can see there's some rare sunshine uh, for this time of year. Um, I hope you're having a good start of the weekend. And for those of you um, who celebrate Lunar New Year, Happy New Year. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce myself and then talk a little bit about my own research, just to give you sort of an impression of um, what anthropology um, is like. So my name is Fabio Gigi. I was born in Switzerland. Um, I was uh, raised and educated in Switzerland, Germany and Japan. Uh, I lived eight years in Japan and Japan is also my regional specialization as an anthropologist. So if you're an anthropologist, usually you have a sort of a focus, a particular region um, where you do field work in and you also have a thematic focus. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about the things and let me start by sharing my screen. Here we go. So I called uh, the talk uh, today, the anthropology of stuff from clutter to robots, because this is really the two topics that sort of um, link uh, my research um, interests together. Uh, but of course, that is not representative um, of anthropology more broadly. That is just uh, what I'm interested in. Hey, Joao, I could just see you coming in there. Excellent. So um, first things first. So when you think about what is anthropology, again, there's a broad range of different ways of answering this uh, question. And I just brought in a few of those in the broadest possible sense. Anthropology is the study of cultural differences and similarities. That's sort of the kind of uh, definition that you find um, in the dictionaries. Uh, but over the last 50 years, of course, interest has also shifted, not only in describing um, cultural difference and similarity, but also to understand how power relations with the state and other institutions shape individual and collective experiences. So it is trying to understand uh, the world from a particular point of view, which may not be the mainstream point of view, right? And this allows anthropology to really investigate a very broad range of different questions. So anything to do with human beings uh, that refers to the cultural, to the symbolic, to the embodied aspects of existence really is the object of anthropology. So for me personally, I like to think of anthropology not so much as sort of a, a predefined set of ideas, uh, but really uh, as a way of asking questions. So the most basic question that you always ask, of course, is why are things the way they are? And sort of trying to find out about that makes you think about common sense, makes you think about what is taken for granted. What do you assume automatically uh, to be part of a particular cultural world? And it is in many ways the an, under, an analysis of this common sense and understanding that this common sense may be very particular to your own experience or very particular to your own cultural backgrounds, that this is really where anthropology starts. So understanding what is taken for granted uh, is really an extremely important um, uh, sort of starting point. And we'll see uh, in some of the examples later um, how that works. Now, this question, why are things the way they are, for me, automatically leads to the question, well, could things not be different? If they are not naturally the way that they are, if the way they are is the result of a particular historical and cultural situation, then of course we can imagine things to be different. And really here, uh, I think is the liberatory potential of anthropology to think about things, not you know, just in a descriptive manner, but also thinking about how could things be different? What would have to change? What changes when we change our assumption 
uh, about what is uh, right and what is real. And so often uh, anthropology in a sort of a shorthand is described as making the strange familiar and the familiar strange. And this has to do with the particular method that anthropology uses. Now, we call it simply fieldwork, and it's usually um, a kind of, uh, it is, a, 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 well, it is a transformative experience because um, it changes and not only the way you think, but also uh, the way you, you, you behave and, and the way you comport yourself. So really what we do as anthropologists, we immerse ourselves in a particular field, usually for one or for two years, we do participant observation, which is exactly as it says on the tin, we participate in the social life of a particular place and we observe what's happening. And we do in-depth interviews to find out what makes uh, people tick, what makes certain ideas circulate. Now this includes learning local languages and learning local uh, codes of behavior. Um, it means to keep extensive field notes and diaries. And crucially, it also uh, implies thinking about your own position as a researcher. What is the particular relationship that you have with your object of research and what makes that possible? Which also has to include a reflection on the larger context in which your research happens, right? And the result of this fieldwork is called ethnography. It's usually a book length study that uh, tells you that, well, basically you try to put in everything you know about the thing into one book. Now I added this picture. This is one of the founder of anthropology, uh, Bronislaw Manilnowski on um, the Trobriand Islands uh, in the 1920s. He was the uh, one of the first um, anthropologists to use fieldwork, to use the full immersive experience. Uh, but many of you may think that this is still what anthropologists do, but that is actually very misleading because contemporary anthropologists are as likely to do fieldwork on contemporary protest movements. You can see here uh, the, the, the removal of coast in Bristol um, or do fieldwork in a robotics uh, laboratory, uh, which you can see at the bottom on the right hand side. So you don't just take the question of cultural uh, difference and uh, sort of assume that this is only applied uh, when you work with native tribes, but you think of it in a much broader way about the contemporary world. And this is really what makes uh, anthropology um, interesting. So I just uh, I thought I, I'd take you um, briefly um, through some of the uh, topics that I've been uh, working on. I've been very interested in my uh, early field work in what it means to own stuff. Now think about the things that you surround yourself with. Uh, you use pens and paper and probably books, but also machines like computers and cell phones. Uh, and all of these um, come to you because of uh, elaborate systems of production and consumption. Uh, you don't know who made them. Uh, you have actually uh, a very limited knowledge in general about how they work. Uh, they are the result of long uh, technical uh, production and uh, creation processes, uh, but they really are quite enigmatic. Now, if you look at uh, uh, before the Second World War, the average person used to own about uh, 500 objects. If you try to count everything you own in your house in a sort of in, in an average London house, uh, and this is some kind of, some field work that Daniel Miller at UCL uh, has done, you'll find that uh, people, no matter what class uh, do they do they belong to, no matter uh, what socioeconomic uh, status they occupy will have between 10,000 and 15,000 objects, right? So where does it all come from? More importantly, where does it go? Of course, this question intimately linked to the idea of disposal and uh, waste. 
and how do we deal with them in your everyday life? So my uh, research um, is about hoarding. Uh, hoarding it's basically um, defined as a psychological uh, problem when you cannot get rid of things of little or no value. And my uh, fieldwork took place in uh, Tokyo. As I, said, uh, as I said, I lived in Japan uh, for eight years. Um, and I, I, I basically my field work was helping people clean up uh, their flats and sort of finding out what uh, makes them attached to things um, and what consequences that uh, this phenomenon has. It's very interesting because when I started my field work in 2006, uh, it was sort of there was quite a bit of media attention. Uh, given to it, uh, but this all sort of starts in the 90s. Before the 90s, you never uh, hear the term hoarding. There's one case in the States um, before the Second uh, World War, uh, but it only really comes into being um, sort of, you know, at the end of the 90s when consumerism, you could say, reaches its uh, most extreme place, especially in Japan, where you have a bubble economy um, a, a very um, buoyant economy in the 80s, uh, where people basically uh, buy new furniture um, every year or every two years and throw everything else away. Now, after the economy crashes, there is a massive change. You suddenly have a hundred yen shop, which is like a one pound shop popping up everywhere. We have recycle shops. Uh, things are no longer thrown away. Things are recycled and it really comes only sort of into being uh, in the 90s. And this is where um, hoarding in Japan uh, becomes visible um, as a social problem, right? I'll just give you here on the left-hand side, you have the psychological, uh, um, the psychological definitions um, of hoarding. But of course, as an anthropologist, my interest is not so much what is, how can I describe this as a particular um, uh, mental uh, disturbance or a pathological state of mind, but how can we understand the relationship that people have with objects? Now, this is uh, from the magazine Spa. Uh, it just uh, give you a, a sense of, of Japanese media reports on what is called gomiyashiki rubbish houses uh, or kadatsuke rarenai onna, women who cannot tidy up. And you can see here, I'll just give you a very short summary um, of what I found in the field, is the interesting thing is that um, the ph phenomenon of hoarding, which in Western psychology and psychiatry is understood as um, you know, a, a, a non-gendered phenomenon, meaning that both men and women are equally, like it, are, are equally uh, likely to be hoarding things. In Japan, there is actually a very clear distinction uh, made. So when a man hoards, that's sort of part of the deal, so to speak. That's just, it's been, being a male uh, makes it okay to be untidy. But if you're a woman, that is considered to be socially very problematic. So what you have is a whole discourse um, uh, in society that uh, pathologizes uh, these women. And that's why the term used is explicitly gendered, right? So this for me was uh, quite surprising um, when I set out uh, to do the research to find out that gender plays uh, a big role in Japan, but does not play a big role in the States and in Germany where I did comparative uh, field work with it. So this is sort of one, I just give you a very uh, brief overview uh, because I also wanted to talk a little bit about uh, my current uh, research interest. So um, from thinking about what interests us in objects, what is the particular attraction that an object uh, has uh, for us? Um, my interest moved towards dolls because they were a category of things that were extremely difficult to throw away, as you can imagine, think of you know teddy bears uh, or, or or stuff that that uh, remained from your childhood, for example. It's very difficult to get rid of because there's both memory embodied in it and there's emotional uh, attachment, but also 
because these things are uh, relational artifacts. They are there because they have a particular relationship with us. But interestingly, over the last 20 years, this understanding again has been revolutionized because now when we talk about a relational artifact, what we mean is an object that reacts to your presence, right? So what kind of object would be that? Think of your phone, right? You touch it, it comes alive, it recognizes you, it scans your face, it has an idea of who you are and who isn't you, so it can only be unlocked by you. And think also about the almost symbiotic relationship that we have with technologies. Now, of course, this is also something that is exploited by companies who create, uh, who create uh, technology, uh, because of course it's much more attractive to interact with a machine that, or an object that has a state of mind, that has a particular mood, right? So a, a relational object really is an object that engages our affect and amplifies our reaction. And the, the, the um, American anthropologist, Sherry Turkle, who's at MIT, um, sort of summed this up in one sense, sentence saying, we connect to what we nurture. So most of you, I assume, will be too young to remember the Tamagotchi. But that was sort of one way that started. It was this little uh, Tamago watch, egg watch, literally translated, uh, where you could hatch a little chicken, but you had to feed it. You had to push the button regularly, otherwise it would die. And this was sort of a swept the world before Pokemon um, and was sort of a big hit. But of course, the implication that this has uh, go far why go far uh, further than just, uh, you know, it's not just the question of the toy. Uh, many of you may remember Sony Ibos. This is the original incarnation. There's a new one uh, now, um, where really the question is, what, what is this? What kind of object is this? Is this, a, is this a pet robot? Is it a high-tech toy? Or is it a new family member? And in order to find out, if you do field work, if you spend a lot of time with people who have Ibos, you find uh, that often uh, what people do with the technology is quite different from what the technology was initially intended uh, to be. And this gap really is only something that you can find out about um, through a longer engagement, right? So for example, uh, uh, Kubo Akinori, a Japanese anthropologist uh, has written about Aibo and uh, basically his conclusion was that the owners were much more fascinated by dancing and dressing their eyeballs rather than to have them behave like a real pet. So they didn't really think of them as pet robots. Um, and when he asked them, well, do you think the eyeball is actually alive? Uh, they didn't say yes or no straight away, but they, they said it is some kind of enigmatic existence, right? And if you think about any kind of object that enters um, your own space. There is an enigmatic dimension to it because you don't know where it comes from. It is usually uh, packed in a particular way to suggest a pristine state. It comes completely new. You unpack it and if you look at on search on YouTube, you'll find hundreds of videos of people unpacking things. It's sort of the unpacking itself has become um, a ritual. Oops, that was one too fast. Um, but of course, this, uh, I mean, there's always a thin line between uh, technology and social engineering. And so uh, uh, relational artifacts have been used in, uh, in, uh, in the research and development uh, stage to add uh, a further dimension, a so further social dimension to the care of the elderly in Japan, perhaps. For example, this is Paro, the robot seal. It can't really do all that much. It can react to your touch. It can react, react to voices. So it does have a particular reaction um, that is uh, partly randomized, but it's precisely the fact that it's randomized that gives the people who engage with it the idea that this thing actually does have a particular state of mind and that it does have a mood. So the reconstruction of human emotions or human interaction through technology 
really in a sense is the holy grail that all the big tech firms are uh, hankering after at the moment. And of course, from an anthropological point of view, that raises a lot of questions about how we think about the human. What is it that we consider to be human and what is non-human and how come then the human and the non-human come together? Now, often that is considered to be a question of the connection of the relationship that we feel, but not in all cases. And I'll finish up with um, a case uh, that that is sort of a goes in the other direction, right? So here you have uh, Azuna. Uh, Azuna is a, a reception android. Um, it can't actually walk uh, or move around. It's basically, it's just a torso of um, a robot. And uh, uh, also the software wasn't quite developed enough for it to actually function in a receptionist capacity. But the interesting thing, of course, there were all kinds of other uses. And so Azuna launched her own uh, book, uh, for example, a sort of a, a, a belonging to the Japanese genre of, um, well, picture books, really, where she's posing in slightly risque um, dress, as you can see here in the background. And the person sitting there on the uh, left hand side with the holding the microphone is uh, the engineer that created her. Um, Toritani Naoshi. And so uh, he said in an interview, and this is, uh, I think, uh, where uh, anthropology again becomes uh, very relevant. Um, when you create an object like a robot, of course, you don't quite know what it is capable of in the beginning, right? How will people react to it? And the only thing what you can do, you can let it interact with people and then observe what's happening. And this, it's a bit of a long quote. Um, but this is quite uh, interesting, um, showing how the sometimes unforeseen um, things that happen when you let people interact with new forms of technology. So he writes, when Azuna participated in an event, a disabled person was moved to tears of joy because Azuna continued to look at them steadily. According to that participant, when people avert their eyes while talking, they suspect that it is distressing for people to look at them and feel hurt as a consequence. On the other hand, when someone looks at them steadily, they worry that they are being stared at in a strange way. But because the participant knew that the android had no hidden intentions or judgments, and the, the Japanese term uragokoro uh, was used, so something that is hidden, uh, that you don't want the other person uh, know, uh, they felt looked at with pure eyes and did not worry. And this was something that never occurred to us before this event. So in this particular case, it was not about creating a human connection with something that is not human, quite the opposite. It was because uh, Asuna was an android, because it was non-human, that this disabled person felt that there was some kind of real interaction. So yes, um, I just bring this up uh, to quickly illustrate. You can do quite a lot with anthropology. You can move from clutter to robotics. But of course, uh, if you look at the uh, SOAS anthropology um, homepage, you will see that there's a, a lot of people who work on all kinds of different uh, interesting topics. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And I'll stop here um, to take your questions. So, um, Fabio, thank you for your presentation. We, we've got uh, plenty of questions from students in, in the chat box and also in Q&A. There are some questions to our student ambassador as well. So now it's the time to ask questions. Uh, can you see them, Fabio, in the Q&A session I in the chat? can see. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. OK, this I uh, can see them. In chat. And uh, let me check the Q&A. Uh, yes, I, I also can see them uh, in the Q&A. Uh, Joao, do you want to uh, start off? Um, so I'll have a quick look at the questions while you talk. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, hello, everyone, by the way. I have to introduce myself. Um, my name is Joao. Um, I'm currently doing uh, MA in Social Anthropology uh, part-time, so this is my first year. Um, uh, as Fabio, uh, I mean, I haven't I haven't specialized yet. Uh, I intend to focus on Japan and my research as well. So I did East Asian studies for my undergraduate degree and I focus 
on Japanese culture and society. Um, and yeah, the reason why I decided to do anthropology was because I felt like there was something missing for my degree. I just saw myself verting towards, you know, society, culture, um, and always picking modules related to anthropology. I know my lecturers told me, oh, like, you should really do anthropology because that's what you're, what you're good at. And yeah, I applied to SOAS and now I'm here. Um, just going through the questions. Right, shall I, 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 I take a few from the Q&A box and uh, then we, maybe we can change uh, back and forth between the two of us. That's it. Okay, so uh, Laila asked, um, when studying anthropology, is it more uh, of choosing a culture and looking at the different dimension and aspects or more of choosing an aspect and assessing it across multiple cultures or both? Excellent question. Now, this really is something that uh, sort of changes quite a lot in the history of anthropology, right? So there's always a sort of a swing back between these two aspects. Um, at the moment, we're moving away from the comparison, from the idea of comparison. Um, because uh, in, in many ways, it's, it's really, you know, if you focus on collective and subjective experience, um, it is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's really difficult to think um, about a comparative framework that does justice to this particular data. If you have a more abstract um, notion or something that you can operationalize in a more sociological way, yes, then that is absolutely possible. But um, I think the important thing uh, in anthropology is always to put uh, facts into their context and to consider how they are also interpreted and understood, not only by the anthropologist, but also by the people in the field. And that makes a direct comparison um, quite different, oh, sorry, quite difficult. Um, on the other hand, there are many anthropologists who sort of like people like Tim Ingold, for example, who recently have sort of shifted more towards uh, um, sort of a, there's a, a renewed call uh, for comparative work, uh, really to look at what comparison can tell us um, about the human condition rather than just uh, ethnography. Uh, but this is an ongoing debate. And in anthropology, you always have aspects um, of both. Shall I take this into the second one as well? Just just do a quick. Uh, there's there's not that many. Oh, I can I can go through them and then we'll look at the chat. Okay. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, somebody asked, are there any links between social anthropology and sociology? I really enjoy sociology, which is why I became interested in this course and was just wondering how similar the two are. Excellent question as well. Now. Of course, anthropology and sociology, we share quite a lot um, of forebears. We share a, sort of a theoretical um, ancestors, uh, you could say, uh, people like Karl Marx uh, uh, and Weber. Um, but normally, nowadays, when uh, you think about sociology, you think about people who work um, uh, in their own uh, cultural context, and that is the only difference. But of course, if you are, if you're a Japanese sociologist working on Japan, basically you're doing exactly the same thing that an anthropologist would do. So there isn't um, that clear a distinction. So if you enjoyed sociology, you will definitely also enjoy anthropology. Um, one thing that I may add to that is that um, well, sometimes the dif difference is sort of formulated in a distinction between uh, quantitative and qualitative methods, meaning that sociology is more prone to use statistics, that you need to have uh, uh, knowledge and background uh, in, uh, or some knowledge in mathematics um, to do that kind of work, while anthropology is usually mostly uh, qualitative, meaning mostly based on interviews, in-depth interviews and participant um, observation. And then there's a question, uh, hoarding in Japan, does socioeconomic status play a role at all? Would a rich woman who hoards be looked down on more less than a poor man who does the same? A very good question. Now, actually, if you think about accumulation um, more generally, you will notice that almost everybody is hoarding to some degree. But of course, if you can afford to put all your things in storage, for example, uh, I call that offshore hoarding it will not be visible in the same way. So in a sense, you can pay for the hoard 
to disappear. And that does not make you the target of all these uh, uh, ideas uh, of uh, pathology. So socioeconomic status uh, plays a very important role. Uh, but again, uh, in my, um, I, I worked with uh, about 56 uh, informants, um, which for anthropology is quite a lot, but for sociology or for somebody who works statistically, of course, uh, is far too little to make uh, sort of broader generalizations. Uh, but I can say I've worked with people from all socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, so it's it's not just, and there's, I mean, there's the common perception that it is um, experiences of deprivation, for example, um, war, war experience sort of lead people to hoard more. Uh, and that is something that, that makes sense to us when we hear it. But actually, if you look at it um, statistically, which is uh, what the psychologists have done, there's only a weak correlation there. Okay, and um, there's a few more. There was one more that's so, ah, yeah, yeah. Um, would you say the uh, evolution of relational artifacts has more or less been spearheaded by Japan? And that is a result, Japan has experienced relatively lessening human interaction between the people, thus leading to their aging population, lowering birth rates, etc. cetera. Um, I, I wouldn't say that it, it has led to uh, the aging population and lowering birth rates, but there is clearly uh, a link. And I think most of these technologies are invented um, to compensate for the loss of the workforce uh, that was already very apparent in the 80s, right? Where you had the, uh, basically the Japanese workplace, uh, the factory was uh, automatized, uh, was mostly robots um, assembling um, cars, for example. Um, but the relational objects that really became important in the 90s, they, they come in, uh, as you as you suggest, when the, sort of this society is going through transformation, and where social ties um, are being rethought, uh, and so in in many ways, um, um, the, the development of uh, robotics in Japan is closely linked to that. And interestingly, if you talk to roboticists, they will always say, "Well, we work on human machine interfaces. We don't work on." Android robotics, because we don't want the military to use our technology, right? So there's also a particular sort of, um, uh, we could say post-war um, ethics uh, that plays into it. Very different from the States, for example, where firms like Boston Dynamic, very, I mean, they they do all these, I don't know, you may have seen um, on YouTube, the dancing uh, military robots. Uh, they try to cutify them, but they're clearly there as military machines. Um, when we are counting stuff, do we also include our digital clutter? Oh yes, absolutely. All the emails we don't do. Current um, inbox, I would just check this morning, is about 5,450 in my case. Blocks of the dormant and files on our deck desktop as well, absolutely. So digital clutter is, is an interesting uh, thing. It's not as obtrusive, of course, um, as as uh, actual objects that sort of spill out of your desktop, uh, but it is problematic as well, especially once you you know if you have fifteen windows open in your background. Uh, this is this is a similar thing, and uh, I think it's not only about materiality, but, the, but the, there's a certain fear about losing the information that if you close something, it will be gone, it will be lost. So uh, there's an a, a, an idea that. It's the presence of the object um, that, um, that, uh, that makes it, that, that it's basically, you know, if, if you don't look at it, it stops existing. That's the implicit fear there. Okay, do you want to take a few, uh, Joel? And then I'll, I'll come back to the question of uh, how secure is social anthropology? Sure, yeah. Um... So I'm just going to answer Sahana because she did a few, she asked a few things. I'm just scrolling up. So the first question was, is it difficult learning virtually? Um, I don't think it's difficult. I think it's different. Um, it's definitely, it's definitely a, a new experience. Um, but it's in my, in my, in my personal experience, it's been quite easy to adapt to. Um, 
because it does relate to your second question. Are your lectures pre-recorded or live? Um, so all, all lectures have been pre-recorded this year, which is really good. So even if, you know, you miss something or, you know, you have another commitment, um, you can just watch lectures another time. Or if you feel you don't understand the topic very well, you can always go back and just re-listen the whole lecture, which I do sometimes. Um, and it's been, no, it's, it, it's, it's been really good. Um, I think tutorials are quite engaging as well. Um, you, like you get a chance to speak whenever you want. Um, you just use the raise hand function, which is quite, quite fun sometimes. Um, yeah, no, it's been, it's been a good experience for me in these past six months, yeah. Um, in terms of disabled, um, disabled access on campus, um, I can only speak for the library because that's where I've been. And I know there is, um, there is ramps and there's disabled access. I'm pretty sure to like every level in the library. Um, so I would assume the other buildings would also have it, but I'm not 100% sure, but I'm, I mean, um, I would, I would think so. Yeah. Um, um, what other question can I ask? Mary, so how do you sell into your ethnographic target community? It must not be easy unless you're already familiar with the gatekeeper. Um, you know, what? I'm not sure either because I've never done field work. Um, I'm very excited to do it. Hopefully, fingers crossed next year or this year if you know things um settle settle down but from do you want to i i can i can take yeah. that yes uh, okay thank yeah. you um <laughs> so uh, yes how do you settle into your ethnographic target community now i i was very lucky because i did an exchange here when i was a high school student and so i i lived with a host family uh in the 90s and um we've been in contact uh ever since and uh so that's that wasn't that wasn't uh, that in a sense that was my gatekeeping to not to my fieldwork but really just to 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 um, you know to get a sense of uh, living um, in Japan. Um, the other well, now when you work with uh, you know uh, in private spaces uh, with people who are sort of looked at as being uh, slightly odd and eccentric uh, or pathological that of course is much more difficult so i recruited uh, people um, via uh, an online forum and of course it was all sort of you know i i offered them the opportunity either to to work with me directly or to um, sort of keep a photo diary for example of their tidying up and we would meet uh, regularly um, to discuss progress or to discuss uh, how this was difficult, uh, but it is a long process, and that's why really you you need. Uh, I spent uh, almost a, a year and a half on my first fieldwork, um, and it's only really in the last few months where things really start to uh, to happen. So it is a lot of time going into um, into sort of relationship building, um, and uh, yes, until you actually really get access and sometimes it doesn't happen in the end right um so it is it is a long process and it, it is not always successful uh, but it is th that which is really at the core um of um of ethnography um there's another question is, uh, i wanted to ask about the process of finding a specialism in a specific country for your research for example how do you go about choosing that country for your research again that's i mean it's up to you um, if you do a PhD in anthropology, um, we do expect that you speak the language or that you plan extra time to, uh, you know, to acquire the language. So that is a, a very important and very time consuming. Um, and uh, so, yes, but, but other than that, it's up to you. I mean, so as we're specialized in basically everywhere, everywhere apart from Latin America. That's that well, it's probably fair to say that um, here, right? Um, okay, so one more question. So as I recently closed down some course because of financial difficulties, how secure is social anthropology? I can reassure you that yes, we are um, up and running. Um, we are okay, we're a small department. Uh, we're uh, quite flexible um, and we're, we're definitely here um, to stay because uh, anthropology as such is sort of, is very, I mean, close to the, the, the core identity. 
um, also, of SOA. Uh, Fabio, we have significantly improved our financial position this year. So there is actually a surplus. So um, we're doing well. We um, did a curriculum review last year. That's why some of the programs were consolidated rather than cancelled completely. Uh, so again, an anthropology I can assure that it's very anthropology. The anthropology department is is very safe. Uh, it's one of our um, most popular departments as well in terms of courses um, at the UG and um, the PG level. Thank you. Uh, there's another question: What fieldwork opportunities are there for undergrad students? Now there are uh, fieldwork opportunities built in some courses. Obviously, uh, this year that was quite difficult. So most people had to do some form of digital fieldwork or Zoom interviews. Um, but you you do a course called uh, Ethnographic Research Methods, for which you do a little um, a, a, an, an ethnographic project. But there's also courses um, like uh, Contemporary Religious Movements, for example, that have a, a built-in fieldwork part. That's usually um, uh, built around London. Um, if you're an, uh, 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 if you write an in independent study project, which is uh, the uh, anthropological equivalent of a dissertation, you can do uh, fieldwork. That's a process that uh, happens over your last year, and you usually do fieldwork over summer. So you have two or three months. Um, of fieldwork, and you will be supervised by a member of uh, staff in the house to do that. So there are uh, opportunities uh, for undergrad uh, students as well, but not, of course, not in the sort of the one year um, uh, uh, time length. Um, to what extent does anthropology try to address historical events? Uh, there is a whole subfield called historical anthropology, um, and especially recently, you know, with Black Lives Matter, for example, um, there's there's uh, been a much more attention being paid to the institutional history of anthropology itself and anthropology's complicities in colonialism, uh, for example. So this is also something um, that has uh, led to a, a, a sort of a much greater research output in historical anthropology. Um, so I'll just take these through and then uh, maybe you can take some more of the chat. Uh, uh, in terms of field work, how will that play a part in the course? We will have to choose a field of study. Um, so I, as I, I mentioned some of this uh, already, it's, um, it uh, depends on the course that you take. So for one of the courses that was uh, not on offer this year because of COVID-19, um, you will uh, participate uh, in a religious movement uh, somewhere in London and write about it, uh, for example. Uh, and it is quite daunting, yes, but you will get uh, this peer support. Uh, you'll sit together in uh, research design groups where you think about what to do, you have methods classes that sort of tell you um, where to go and what to do. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of uh, peer support uh, as well. Uh, then there's a, 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 Leili, a more specific question. Good morning. I'm very interested in exploring the strong emergent countercultures in Japan as juxtaposed with traditionally assigned gender roles and expected societal duties after spending time there. I was curious how you uh, found connecting with people happy to participate in your research initially and how open to involvement they were. Uh, if you, oh, right, of course, I don't mind answering. So the um, the thing, it's, it's really, it's about often about language ability. If you speak the language fluently, you will be able to reassure, uh, you know, participants very quickly that this is, you know, something that is uh, doable because there's lots of, um, anxiety also about misunderstandings and so on and so forth but uh, and again it it um, obviously it also has to do with your own positionality um, so if you try to do research on a subculture for example but you're a complete outsider you know you don't share any of the interests for example then that would be more difficult it would you would appear uh, as a more strange figure um, but if, of course, you shared some of the interests and some of the with sexual orientation or gender identity, then that would be a way to, um, you know, to address these things. And I have several of my PhD students um, are doing that. 
Um, so there's definitely the possibility uh, to do uh, work like that. Um, could you give an example of the sort of task assignment you would set in first year? Um, yes, so traditionally what you do in first year is um, you do a lot of, um, uh, you learn to write an academic essay, but that is not as daunting as it perhaps sounds. So there's usually a broad range of different ways of doing it. Um, so one way, um, for example, this year we had uh, students write a dialogue between two anthropologists or two thinkers for the social theory module, which is um, uh, one thing, one module that you have to take as a first year undergrad. So imagine what would uh, Karl Marx say uh, to, um, let's say, Michel Foucault, two thinkers that uh, we treat um, in the course, um, or what would Freud Sigmund Freud um, say to uh, Evans Pritchard. So there's there's ways in which that you know you can um, make it a bit more creative and interesting. Uh, Fabio Joao, unfortunately we need to finish now because we have another um, taster session right. scheduled. Uh, thank you very much Joao and, and Fabio for answering all the questions of, and for a wonderful presentation. I've shared your email addresses with our students, I hope you don't mind. So yeah. everyone, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry we're not able to answer all the questions right now, but if you have any, any questions, any inquiries, please please feel free to reach out to Joa and um, Fabio. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you for coming and I hope you have a nice weekend.